Usually, video game sequels find some light to innovate over the original. In one sense, you have the sequels that build up from what the original started. For instance, Sly 2 built up all the mechanics from Sly 1, and also added new features such as the sandbox and mission structure while maintaining the core stealth and platforming gameplay. On the other hand, you have the sequels that just completely start over from scratch and have nothing in common with the original in order to conform with the changing tastes of that generation. <clears throat> Jack 2. But we are here to discuss Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. Is it a new and innovative direction for the Crash Bandicoot series? Or does it fall into the pile of shit that is sequelitis? Let's find out. Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back started development sometime around October 1996. A lot of the efforts went into designing the Ghoul 2 engine, which allowed the game to handle 10 times the animation frames and twice the polygon rate compared to the original. This is basically what made the game as smooth as butter and the controls and animation much more fluid compared to the previous game. Crash 1's engine was thrown out. Crash 2's engine is totally new. It allows us to have more polygons in the background, more frames of animation. As for my own personal experience with the game, it wasn't until I was much older that I finished this game 100%, so maybe that allows me to look at this installment with fresh eyes. So the story begins where the first game left off. Crash Bandicoot has destroyed Cortex's hovercraft, and Cortex is left falling helplessly to his death. That is, until he uncovers a crystal from underground. With a dastardly laugh, Cortex hatches an evil plan. <laughs> Can I just talk about how devious Clancy Brown is as Cortex? I mean, first you had Brendan O'Brien, who I guess was serviceable at best, but Mr. Krabs and Savage Opress being the evil scientist himself? It just fits perfectly. I hate you. Anyway, Cortex heads up to his space station where his assistant engine informs him that he doesn't just need one crystal to make his plan work. Instead, he needs 25 slave crystals in order to work his operation. They have no friends on the surface, but that doesn't stop Cortex from working around this. Meanwhile, Coco's batteries to her laptop die and she tells Crash to go get her a new battery pack. On a side note, isn't it kind of strange that Crash needs to look for a battery pack in a jungle? So Crash is wandering through the jungle when... NANI?! And Crash gets transported to the warp room where Cortex greets him. Cortex instructs Crash Bandicoot to go get the crystals with no explanation initially, and off he goes, going on a fetch quest for crystals. Overall, you may say that it's a fine enough plot. It actually tends to be a lot more involved than the first game. The pacing is pretty good, as more and more of Cortex's facade starts to peel away, and Coco reveals his true intentions. However, herein lies the main problem with Cortex Strikes Back. Why does Crash instantly trust Cortex? I mean, this is the guy that tried to kill you at the end of the last game. Also, Cortex really establishes himself as a villain towards the beginning of the game. Just look at his evil laugh. Look at some of these opening scenes introducing him. <laughs> Crystals. Of course. Fool! Do you think I'm unaware of the situation? If we don't have any friends left on the surface, then we need to find... An enemy. He comes across as menacing and scheming, and you're telling me that this guy suddenly has a change of heart? So you are basically playing into the villain's evil mastermind plan. Oh yeah, and what was the title of the game? Cortex Strikes Back? It almost feels like the writers at Naughty Dog wanted a player to already know that Cortex was lying to you. If that's the case, why should I feel encouraged to do anything in the game if I'm willingly walking into a trap? This could have worked if maybe they had done away with the opening scenes of Cortex showing himself to be evil, start with Coco asking Crash to get her more batteries, then you wouldn't know anything about Cortex's real plot. And of course, changing the title of the game could also help too, considering it definitely gives it away. So yeah, the story doesn't quite hold up, but Crash Bandicoot 2 does bring about more characterization compared to the original Crash Bandicoot. Unlike in the previous Crash Bandicoot where most characters showed up in one cutscene and disappeared, Crash 2 makes them more defined by having them communicate with Crash. I already talked about Cortex, but Clancy Brown really does give him more of a soul. 
Whether it be his evil laugh or his constant smooth talks, the crash to deceive him, he really does sell himself as the evil doctor, not just by name. No, 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 crash. I said bring me the On the other hand, you also have Embryo, who has now betrayed his old master from the events of the first game and urges Crash to gather the gems so that he can build a laser to destroy the Cortex Vortex. Brendan O'Brien really shows the stuttering genius Embryo is. I don't know, just listen to him. You are allied with Cortex! You are my sworn enemy, and I will do anything in my power to, to, to stop you! And as for Crash himself, well, I've always felt like he had the most amount of personality even though he couldn't speak. The way he looks around the area if you leave him idly for too long, the special dance he does after beating a boss or collecting a gem, or even the fearful look in his eyes every time the hologram activated. It always made me feel like Crash was someone who always had like a child-like curiosity of the world around him. A character that was daring and assertive, but also carefree of how he came across, which definitely lightens the tone to someone tasked with saving the world. The only character I have some gripes with is Coco. Now for the most part, she serves as a plot device to inform Crash of Cortex's plot, but uh, she doesn't really do too much else. Naughty Dog inserted her because Tana apparently was too sexualized of a character for little kids, I guess? In canon, the excuse they had for getting rid of Tana was because she dumped Crash for Pinstripe. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Tana just disappears and is replaced with Coco to make a more kid-friendly female character. Although, that hasn't stopped the internet from... You know. Okay, so we've done both story and characterization. So the next one on the list is... Oh boy, I'm gonna piss a lot of people off with this one. So yeah, I'm sure most of you are going to feel like... You son of a bitch! After I talk about the gameplay, but hear me out. Crash 2's gameplay isn't inherently bad. It actually manages to make some improvements compared to the original. For instance, the controls. Crash's jumps are now more precise. I never felt like I was overshooting a jump. At the same time, Crash doesn't gain any forward momentum when he spins. He also gains new abilities like a body slam, a slide dash, and a high jump. Generally speaking, the game also expands upon the level designs that the first game had. Crash gets to explore sewers, temple ruins, and outer space. The game also puts a lot more emphasis on non-linearity compared to the first game, so now you can choose whatever level you want without having to be restricted to a map. However, for every plus, there is a negative. For what is taken away from this is that while Crash 1 felt like the player was going on a journey through the constantly changing level designs, Crash 2 constantly repeats similar level designs three or four times. I know this is a very common criticism for Crash 2, but I noticed the pattern of the game introduced in di different versions of the same level. Sometimes enemies would be placed differently to make it harder, but it generally felt like the same environment. Another issue with Crash 2 is the overabundance of secret areas. You usually get most gems by breaking all the boxes. However, now Crash 2 introduces secret areas and differing methods with how to get the certain gems, especially the colored gems. For instance, to get the blue gem, you have to go through the entire first level without breaking a single box. If that wasn't obscure enough, in order to get the green gem, you have to head down a pathway into level sewer or later that is filled with nitros. I guess the nitros are supposed to make the player feel like there is something all the way at the end of the tunnel, but all the player sees is the end of a wall. How are they supposed to figure out the jump through this invisible barrier? Better yet, there is a trail of boxes and air crash that supposedly lead to a platform that takes you to a secret warp room where you go through a secret area of snow go for the red gem. And there are so many secrets like these. The secrets do add a certain level of exploration, however, they are a bit too obscure and these did admittedly confuse me a lot as a kid. On a related note, there are the death routes. They basically require you to get to a certain point in the level without dying. Stand on them, and they'll take you to a harder portion of said level. All of these aspects break up the flow of Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. So even though the level designs tend to repeat too much, at least the alternate paths and death routes provide for differing ways to look at the stages. 
Now here's another thing worth mentioning are the multitude of vehicles that Crash 2 introduces. You're able to ride on a jet ski, charge to the snow with a polar bear, and fly in a jetpack. There are also a couple of levels where you can dig underground. Sometimes these get mixed in with other types of levels. For instance, you'll be running away from a giant bear while riding a cub. But for the most part, they all have one issue. The jet ski controls too loosely to the point it is easy to run into nitros or other obstacles. The polar bear is too stiff to the point it is too easy to hit things in the way sometimes. And a jetpack? It only shows up for two levels. Like, this is what Crash was wearing in the opening of the game, and it only makes it in for two levels plus a boss. As for how it controls, it feels very slow trying to plot through the level at a sluggish pace, but I will say that this aspect does make it very atmospheric. Again, you only used a jetpack for two levels before having to fight a boss with it. Speaking of bosses... Better than the first game, but don't quite reach their full potential. Ripperoo is easy as fuck and just hops around laying nitros and TNTs. Just keep your distance and spin him when stunned. He even kinda does himself in. The Komodo Bros? Just have them attacking one at a time. I'm not even sure how to describe this one, but if double teaming Crash can't beat him, then something's fucked up with your strategy. Tiny is just hopping around on platforms, hardly even a fight. And Engine? Well this one I thought was pretty cool, so you're throwing Wampa Fritz at the multiple different body parts of Engine's robots, all the while he is firing laser beams, rockets, and energy blasts. Overall, I think this is one of the good bosses of the game. It's paced very well with the different stages of the boss. And then there's Cortex. Right. Get pumped for this one. The final boss. They really built him up for all the hype of him being the evil mastermind behind everything. Making you collect crystals and everything all. And now, it is time to best him. Man, I'm getting some lingering will vibes with this one. And you just chase him down, spin him three times, and you win. Wow. I don't even know what to say. Just underwhelming. It's not even a fight, just a chase. Overall, bosses... better, but not quite living up to their full potential. I feel like that sums up Crash 2. It makes improvements over the original, but at the same time doesn't fully capitalize upon it. The level designs are more varied than before, but there's more repetition of them. The bosses have improved, but tend to be too simplistic that they can be beaten a little over a minute. The warp room provides non-linearity, but takes away from the Odyssey quest of the original. For every improvement, there feels like something was taken away. Crash 2 is a fine sequel that doesn't quite succeed on all fronts of totally improving over the original in a complete way. I don't know how else to describe it. Well. The game ends with Coco noting to Crash that the Cortex Vortex is still up there. However, if you collect all 42 gems, Inbrio contacts you to build the laser to destroy the Cortex Vortex. From there, Cortex's ship comes hurtling down. What a nice ending. <laughs> Free at last. Well, and that was uh, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back. Uh, Hope you all enjoyed, and uh, no, it's not quite my favorite game to talk about, and I'm sure all of you could tell based on my rather dull tone of voice at the video. However, if there is one caveat, it's that next time we get to talk about Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. My favorite is a trilogy, but uh, we'll see if that changes or not if I don't kill myself until then. <laughs>